my YouTube channel. My name is Saurabh and today I'm going to focus on introduction to DevOps. So without any further ado, let us move forward and have a look at the agenda for today. So this is what we'll be discussing today. We'll begin by understanding what exactly is DevOps and how it works. We'll also look at various DevOps phases and what are the various DevOps tools available in the market. After that, we'll focus on a couple of use cases of DevOps, how it can be implemented in real life. And then finally, in the hands-on part, I'll show you how you can prepare a build pipeline using Jenkins. So let's move forward, guys, and understand what is DevOps. So here I'll be discussing only about DevOps, what exactly it is. So DevOps is basically a software development strategy. It is not a tool. It is not a technology. It is not a framework. It is a methodology. And the aim of this methodology is to bridge the gap between development team and the operations team. There are a lot of conflicts between the two teams. For example, the software works in the developer's laptop, but it doesn't work in the test or the production environment. Similarly, the dev team wants agility, whereas the ops team wants stability. So there are many other conflicts between the dev and the ops side of the company, which are resolved with the help of DevOps, right? So what exactly is DevOps? Basically, it is a software development strategy. And the aim of the strategy is to bring together the dev and the ops side of the company. Now, this slide basically tells us about what are the various phases involved in DevOps and what are the various tools available for those phases. So the first thing is planning. You get the requirement from the client, you start planning your application. Right. And once planning is done, you start writing the code. Now there are multiple developers who are writing code for that particular application. So you need a system that can manage the code. For example, if I want to go back to the previous commit, how can I do that? Or if I want to check the previous version of the code, basically to manage the source code, we have multiple tools like Git subversion. Git is a decentralized version control tool and is preferred by most of the industries. After that, the code is built. Now build lifecycle includes a lot of things. It includes validation of your application, compiling your application, packaging your application, performing unit tests, integration tests. All of those things are done in this space. Then what happens, the build application is deployed onto the test servers for testing. And once testing is done, it is deployed onto the prod servers for release. And after that, it is continuously monitored by tools like NagOS and Splunk. Now let me focus on the tools which are there. So for the build, we have multiple tools like Maven, Ant, and Gradle. Depending on the kind of application you have, you choose the build tool. For Java applications, we usually go for Maven. Then for testing, that is the end user testing, or you can even consider it as functional testing in this case, we use Selenium. After that, in order to deploy the application onto the prod servers, there are tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and Solstack. So Puppet, Chef, Ansible, and Solstack tools like these are called configuration management tools. Their major aim is to provision and deploy your application, to provision your nodes. For example, in the test server, I might require a particular software stack, maybe a LAMP stack, right? So I can write scripts using these tools and can deploy it onto the test servers as well as in the prod servers. So all of these four tools have a similar architecture that is a master slave architecture in which I can write the scripts for a particular software stack in the master and deploy it onto the nodes, right? So with this, we can actually maintain an accurate historical record. I can do that as well because everything is well documented in the master so it can be a puppet master it can can be a chef master it can be ansible control machine or it can be a salt master as well so these are the four tools that we call configuration management tools and they play a major role in devops now for docker it is basically a containerization platform so what i mean by that is you can create docker containers which provide the consistent computing environment throughout the sdlc lifecycle Plus, it basically machines. If you have heard about microservices, so Docker is a, an ideal environment to have a microservice architecture, right? I'll discuss more about Docker in detail later on. Currently, just understand that it is a containerization platform. Now, the heart of DevOps is this integration phase that you can notice here. And the most famous containerized integration tool is called Jenkins. Jenkins has well over 2,500 plugins for various development, testing, and deployment technologies. So what exactly is integration stages, whether it's coding, building source code management or building your application, testing it, deploying it, monitoring it. All of these phases are integrated with the help of tools like Jenkins. So let me give you a scenario how we can use Jenkins. The moment any developer makes a change in build, once the build lifecycle is complete, it will deploy that build application onto the test servers for testing then it will deploy it onto the prod servers for release 
And finally, it will be continuously monitored by tools like NagaOS, which will give the feedback to Jenkins. And guys, this is one use case that I'm telling you about. And this is basically continuous deployment. So this is basically how we can use Jenkins in DevOps lifecycle. Now let's move forward and we'll focus on how you can implement DevOps. And the example is that you have repository. This is how you're managing your code. You have multiple developers committing code to the shared repository several times a day. So Jenkins will pull that code, prepare a build, then deploy it onto the test servers, and then finally deploy it onto the prod servers. Your test and prod servers are configured by tools like Puppet, Chef, and Ansible. So these tools, the CM configuration management tools that I'm talking about, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, are really important, guys, because they not only maintain the accurate historical record of your system state, they also ensure that the computing environment remains same throughout the software delivery lifecycle. My major aim is to replicate what is there in a developer's laptop throughout the software delivery lifecycle so that I don't face a problem where the application works fine in the dev laptop but doesn't work well in the production or in the test environment, right? So that's why we use Puppet Chef and uh, Ansible. Now let me tell you a very good example where Puppet has actually saved millions of dollars. Everyone's heard about New York Stock Exchange, right? So in New York Stock Exchange, the software of eight trading terminals was upgraded with the help of Puppet. It was working fine that day, but in the next morning, it didn't work properly. There were a lot of bugs with that. Now, with the help of Puppet, New York Stock Exchange was able to roll back to the previous stable version of the software stack within 90 minutes. People might think that 90 minutes is a lot, but it is not. It is actually a success of configuration management due to which the New York Stock Exchange was able to save billions of dollars. Imagine what would have happened if the problem would have continued. So this is an example of DevOps, how you can implement it. Now, let me talk about Docker a bit, how you can implement a Docker in DevOps, right? So these are the two ways in which you can use Docker in DevOps. So what happens, a developer writes the project code in a Docker file. For example, a requirement for a microservice, whatever the requirement for the application is, the developer will write a simple Docker file, right? It's very easy to write. Once the Docker file is written, we can build Docker images from that. And with that Docker image, we can build as many containers as we want. Now containers are nothing but an environment where you can run your application. For example, if I require a Linux environment, I can run a Linux Docker container, right? Similarly, that depends on the kind of environment that you want. Then what you can do is you can upload that Docker image onto Docker Hub and through Docker Hub, various teams, be it staging or production, can pull that Docker image and prepare as many containers as they want. Now, Docker Hub is nothing but a Git repository of Docker images. Now, with this architecture, what is the advantage? So whatever was there in the developer's laptop, I was able to replicate it in the staging as well as in the production environment. Similarly, there's one more way you can use Docker. So if you write a complex requirement for a microservice in a Docker file, upload that onto the Git repository. So from Git repository, Jenkins can pull that Docker file and build whatever was there in the developer's laptop into testing, staging, and production. Right? So these are the two ways in which you can use Docker in DevOps. Now let's move forward and we'll understand a very interesting topic called continuous integration, continuous delivery, and continuous deployment. I actually noticed that a lot of people have confusion behind these three concepts. So let me just clear that doubt for you. And it is one of the very important concepts in DevOps. So let me introduce continuous integration first. So the moment any developer commits a change in the source code, the continuous integration tools like Jenkins can pull that code, prepare a build. Once build is done, it can perform unit and integration testing as well, right? Till this stage, it is called continuous integration. Right, you are not deploying your application onto any server, even for testing purpose, right? Even for functional regression testing. So this is basically integration stage. Now, what you can do next is automatically deploy that to the test environment to perform acceptance testing, or you even call it user acceptance test, UAT test, or the end user testing. So once you do that in an automated fashion, it becomes continuous delivery. Now, continuous deployment is basically deploying your application after testing into production for release. So continuous deployment is something which is not a good practice because even after the end user testing, there might be some checks that you need to do or you need to market your application, right? So there might be multiple things that you want to do and you don't want it to be automatically released, right? You want to perform a lot of checks before you release it in the market. So that's why continuous deployment is not a good practice, whereas continuous delivery is what every company tries to achieve nowadays. So I hope I'm clear. The moment any developer commits a code until the unit and integration test where your application is not deployed onto any server or any environment, it is integration testing. Once it is deployed to the test environment for user acceptance test, it becomes continuous delivery. And when it is deployed to production for release, then it becomes continuous deployment. So this is the difference between continuous integration delivery and deployment. I hope you have understood it. Now let's discuss the DevOps use case. So we are going to implement this use case practically in today's session. 
So what we are going to do, we are going to use Jenkins to prepare a build pipeline in which we'll compile the code, we'll review it, we'll perform unit testing, we'll package it, and we'll deploy it manually, guys. Remember that we are going to deploy our application manually. So I will also tell you how to do it automatically, but in our use case, in our practical, we are going to deploy it manually. We will be using Jenkins for this purpose. So there's a source code repository present in GitHub, right? So over there, the test cases are already written. It is basically an address book application. It's a Java application. So I'll be using Maven here, and I've already installed Jenkins in my Ubuntu box. So you can go ahead and refer the Jenkins installation video if you have any difficulties in installing Jenkins, right? So let me just open my Ubuntu machine, and I'll show you there. So guys, this is my Ubuntu box and over here, I've already installed Jenkins and I've configured it at port 8080. And these are the jobs that I was talking about in the use case as well. First, I'm going to compile the code, then I'm going to review it, then perform testing, and then finally package it into an executable format or in a distributable format. Let me show you how you can create a project. So first thing you need to click on new item, right? Once you click on new item, you'll be directed to a page, something like this, where you need to enter the name of your project and the type of project. So I've created a freestyle project. So all the jobs that you're seeing here, all the projects are actually freestyle projects because it is pretty flexible. Apart from that, there are a lot of features which are there in the other projects are present in the freestyle project as well. So let me just quickly give you a walkthrough of these projects. So the first thing is compile. So I'll just go ahead and click on configure and I'll show you how I have configured it. The first thing I need to do is give a name to my project. So basically the Git repository where my source code is present. When I click on build app, I've invoked the top level Maven targets. So Maven has this build lifecycle. Let me explain you that. Now, a lot of people think that build only means compile. It doesn't mean that. There's the entire build life cycle where you can validate the code, where you can compile it, test it. Basically, you can test the compiled source code using a suitable unit testing framework. And these tests should not require the code to be packaged or deployed. Then you can even package your application, uh, take the compiled code and package it in a distributable format such as jars or wars. You can verify your source code, you can install a package, and you can finally deploy your application as well. So this is basically Maven build lifecycle. And first thing we are going to do is invoke the compile phase of the Maven build lifecycle. Just click on apply and save. Let me go back to the dashboard and I'm going to show you the code review project as well. Let me go ahead and click on configure and pretty much the same, the name of the project, right? The code review, then source code management, the basically the GitHub repository where my code is present. Then in the build triggers tab, let me just take you these things. So trigger builds remotely. You can use scripts for that. You can build after other projects are built. So I'm going to build it after the source code is compiled. Then I can even click on build periodically. I can click on build when a change is pushed to the GitHub. I can even poll my source code repository. That is my GitHub repository. I can configure Jenkins to poll the GitHub repository at regular intervals. And uh, if there's any change, then it will pull that change and prepare a build for me. So here I'm going to show you how to build a project when other projects are built. So after compiling the source code, my code will be reviewed using the PMD analysis. So here also I'll invoke the top level Maven targets. Now let me explain you what PMD is. So it is an extensible cross language static code analyzer. What I mean by that, it basically finds common programming flaws like unused variables, empty catch blocks, unnecessary object creation and so forth. It basically scans source code in Java and other languages for potential problems like possible bugs. What can be possible bugs? For example, empty try catch finally switch statements. It also checks for dead code. So dead codes are basically unused local variables, parameters, and, and, and private methods, things like that. It also checks for suboptimal code, which is nothing but wasteful string, string buffer usage, etc., etc. And it also looks for overcomplicated expressions. If I have to give you an example, think of you know unnecessary if statements or for loops that could be actually while loops, right? So these are the things that the PMD analysis report will give us, right? And this is where it will be stored post build actions tab. Let me just give you a walkthrough of this build. So here are multiple options. You can execute shell, you can invoke and you can invoke Gradle scripts, right? So there are a lot of things that you can uh, go ahead and check out. I'm using invoke top level Maven targets, apply and save. So if you want to see the PMD analysis report, I'll just show you, I've already executed this project once so I can see the analysis report here. So uh, it says that there's a number of packages, then a number of files present, then there are multiple categories. So there are empty code, which are four. Unnecessary are five, unused code is two. Then what are the types of these warnings? So we have, let me show you, empty catch blocks. There are two empty catch blocks and a two empty finally block. And unused private fields are two. Unused plus parentheses are five. Then let me show you the warnings. These are the various warnings. And if you want to find the details, so here you can find all the details of the warnings that are present in the report. So this was about uh, the source code review. Then let me show you the tests project. So let me just go ahead and click on configure. It's pretty simple guys, pretty basic what I've done in the other projects. Go to source code management tab. Here you'll find the repository link. 
build triggers i'm going to build it once my code review is done and then i'm going to invoke the top level maven target in which i'll invoke the test phase of my maven build life cycle let me just go ahead and save and apply let me go back to the dashboard again and i'll finally show you how i have packaged my application so i'll go and click on configure and over here you can find that when you go to source code management tab you'll find the github repository link then when you click on build triggers it'll be built after other projects are built and finally in uh, the top level maven targets i'm going to invoke the package phase of the build life cycle of maven that's pretty much it let me go back to the dashboard and what i'm going to do is i'm going to create a pipeline view so i'm going to give a name to my pipeline so let the name of my pipeline be build pipe right you can give whatever you name you want i know it's not a pretty fancy name just click on okay you'll be redirected to a page that will basically ask you to configure your pipeline the way you want it's pretty self explanatory just give a name to your pipeline description how you want the layout to be so i want compile to be my initial job then build cards the number of displays so i can just select any row headers if you want right column headers currently there are no headers so i just click on just the build number and the name refresh frequency is 3 seconds uh, just click on apply and okay so my pipeline is uh, configured now all i have to do is click on run so the first step is basically compiling the source code so you can see that it is executing when it's yellow in color that means it is executing so let me just finish this yeah so if i click here i can see the console output as well so here you can find all the necessary logs as well so my source code compiling step is done right uh, compiling the source code is done now it is reviewing the code similarly if you click here you can find the necessary logs here right you can find all the details there after this unit testing will be performed test cases are already written in the source code so yeah you can see that code review is done now the test project will be executed so you can see that it has started executing the test project and then after this it will package my application into a war file similarly if you click here you can see the uh, console output or the necessary logs that you want to see and uh, let's just get over and after every 3 seconds it is refreshing so you can see that my package project has started so it has started implementing the package project uh, you can see that it is yellow in color that means it is currently executing it so you can see here that uh, the logs are present here you can just have a look yeah so let's just wait until uh, it is executing so it is done now you can see that my war file will be created in this particular directory let me just open my terminal and show you there as well let me clear it so when i go to that particular directory and hit an ls command i can find my address book.war has been created now i'm going to deploy this war file on a tomcat server so uh, for that i need to start the tomcat server and uh, let me show you how i can do that first i'll go to this tomcat directory let me clear the terminal yeah i need to change my directory to tomcat9 now over here i'll just execute the startup script startup.sh yeah so my tomcat server is running let me just go to that particular port so i have configured it on 8000 local host port 8000 is my port number where i've configured tomcat when i click on manager apps i'll be directed to this particular page and over here all i have to do is give a context path so let that be edureka hyphen war and the directory where it is present so i'll just write here address book.war i'll click on deploy and finally you'll see that my application has been deployed so edureka.war is present all right so you can see that it has been deployed now let me go back to my slides so i hope uh, you have enjoyed the practical that we have just executed so let me just give you a quick walk through of all things we have done So we have a source code repository present in GitHub. So I've just uh, used that repository, and with Jenkins, I'm using Maven in order to compile the source code, then review it, then perform unit testing, and then finally packaging it. And then I've deployed it manually on a Tomcat. So, right. So this is what I've done, and I've used Jenkins for this particular practical. So I hope this session was useful for you guys. Thank you, and have a great day.